Hello and welcome to another installment of Lutra TV. My name's Amanda, I'm one of the process engineers here at Lutra and I'm joined today by two familiar faces to talk about the value of data in water and wastewater operations. Um, I'll introduce Jonathan, Principal Process Engineer and Quentin, uh, Chief Customer Officer. So when I think of data, the first thing that comes to mind is compliance, monitoring and reporting. But it can be so much more than that, right? Uh, so why are we so interested in data and why is it so powerful? I think probably to start off, um, data is knowledge, right? So, and that sounds a little bit corny, but without having data on your treatment plants or your network, you just generally don't know what's going on. So whether that be manual data through lab samples, whether that be automated telemetry data coming from the field, you need something like that just to give you an indication of, you know, how your plants are performing, what's happening in the network, and then trying to tie those things together. So without data, you really are running blind. Yeah, and data fundamentally is all about making decisions. The reason people capture data, um, no matter what the source is, whether it's somebody taking a sample or, like you say, it's limited data, um, you need to be able to get that data and to make a decision. And, you know, is it good data, is it bad data? Um, should I do something about it? So yeah, critically important. So it sounds like you've got a lot to consider then when you're assessing the data for your plant. There's got to be some catches, right? What are some of the challenges that there might oh, be yeah. for working <laughs> with data? These, I mean, I, I think this is kind of, and a lot of suppliers don't do justice when they say, you know, using your data, getting insights from your data, things like that. So it sounds really easy. You know, just grab a couple of big pipes of data, connect them together, and wow, we get all these insights and we can make all these great decisions. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot more than that. And um, I think what we see is a few sort of common challenges. So one of the biggest ones is the quality of data coming in and even having that trust around that data initially. So whilst you might be getting um, data points coming from the field, they may have some context around them which you might not initially understand. So it's about understanding that context and trying to cleanse that data to make it useful. Now, in any sort of project around this sort of um, you know, the use of data, data cleansing and data understanding is probably the largest part. The insights part is generally the easy part. It's actually knowing what you have, verifying it's correct, and then cleansing out all the, all the rubbish um, is probably some of the biggest catches that we see. Is that mm. fair? That's fair. And another, another common problem with it as a long time um, Excel spreadsheet user is that syn synchronizing different types of data is extremely difficult. You might have somebody who's writing things down on paper out in the field. You might have a, a remote telemetered source. And then you might have another remote telemetered source that might not be using daylight savings, for instance. And you want to bring all three of these things together mm. because they all might be measuring something like a chlorine residual um, and figure out what's going on so you can make a decision about it. And um, yeah, getting, getting all three of those to sync up in a certain time so that it makes sense um, is always a challenge because they're coming from different places and they have different formatting and, and yeah. Okay, so we can obviously end up with these really big, potentially very messy data sets that we've got to do something with to get some meaningful, meaningful results out of, right? Um, I come to mind something that one of my lecturers used to say at uni, which was you put garbage in, you get garbage out. Um, what would you have to say about how we can clean up those data sets to actually get meaningful information out of them? Yeah, I think there's, there's kind of two parts to this problem. So there's dealing with historic data, which is kind of problem one, but there's also dealing with your future data sets as well. So um, one of the biggest mistakes that you know we sort of see when people are putting in brand new systems, again, it's that thing that this system is going to solve everything. But linking into your garbage in, garbage out comment, you really need to get the staff on board. Because the staff um, who are running your operations, who are doing things in the field, who are collecting that data, whether it be manual or we're doing automated sources, um, they really need to be invested in the outcomes of what the software platform or what this data is going to be used for. So they have to see some real benefits. If they don't, what you'll generally find is that no matter how good a software platform is, they will generally just revert back to old habits. They'll revert back to writing things on paper and, and maybe entering it sometime this week, maybe next week, who knows. But you know, it, you have to really sort of look at what data you're trying to collect, 
understand that, and then going forwards, how you actually get that staff buy-in um, across your entire set of operations so that they are really invested in, in putting good quality data in so you can get good quality results out. Uh, in terms of historic data, that's always a challenging one. Um, again, you just got to work with what you work with. So that's where I guess you do come across specialties like data scientists and data analysts who really do sit down and they know how to look through that data, they know how to cleanse it. But again, you still need the context. So that's where having either really good input from the end user and actually giving some context around that data or having input from engineers and the likes can actually really kind of frame up how that data should look or what good data looks like. Once you have that understanding, then you can generally work with that historic data to you know, mold it into the format that you need. Um, but I think my, my key one is always looking forwards. And if you're looking forwards, you really need to get that staff buy-in because otherwise, like say, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, and yeah, I guess uh, not much to add to that, Clinton, but it's um, at least in a practical sense, you can take the example of something like a, like a let's say, a pH analyzer. You know, you might have three, three different sources of data for that. You have the analyzer reading, um, you have the flow rate of the treatment plant, and you also might have a log of when the analyzer has been calibrated. Now, if somebody wants to figure out how, how well that analyzer has been performing, if it's drifting, perhaps, maybe it's mm. getting a bit old and it's getting less sensitive and they want to work that out, you basically need all three pieces of information. You need to know when the plant was operating because mm. often the data for the pH analyzer will change when there's no flow. It'll drop off. Um, or something like that. And you also need to know when it's been calibrated because whenever that's occurred, um, the value might have shifted up or done something strange um, and you get an outlier or maybe just a correction in what you're seeing. So um, yeah, basically if you, if, you want to, if you want to actually understand your data, just looking purely at the trend of the pH isn't going to tell you as much as you'd like it to. So this is where your expertise as an operator or an engineer or a uh, a, I don't know, a scientist in the water industry can then be applied to a data set to actually get some meaningful conclusions from it. Um, can you talk to any sort of practical examples where we've actually seen this in reality? Um, yeah, so I mean there's, there's a lot of mm. practical examples of this. So, you know, cleaning, cleaning up pH, pH readings is, is probably one of the smallest ones, you know. Um, in terms of being able to apply information that most people commonly have recorded in some form mm -hmm. to gain insights. Um, for, for instance, a, a filter, a standard gravity filter on a treatment plant, you likely record the head loss and probably the flow through the filter. Um, however, the head loss itself is represented as just head loss. And as we all know, the head loss will change with the amount of flow rate that you have going through it. So putting two and two together, you can put the head loss and the flow rate together to get a dynamic head loss. Now, treatment plants typically don't do that in SCADA, um, but if you've got the data, you can do it. And what that can give you is what your actual true filter performance is. So if you want to see how well it's, um, how, well, sorry, how well, how badly it might be mudballed or fouled, you can compare the dynamic head loss over time to five years in the past and see what it was like. Um, another example might be something like getting a a series of parameters, say raw water parameters, and bringing them together um, to infer a change in the raw water. So cha changing conditions and change leading to contamination are a big theme of the new, um, the new Water Services Act. And you, you, often people will measure various different parameters for various reasons, and it might be handheld, might be instruments, might be things like that. But if you have all of this data, you can bring it together and basically statistically tell that things are not quite right. So things are starting to drift, they're getting out of whack, um, something is changing in your source. Um, whether it's on an instantaneous basis because you're using minute data, or whether it's because you have a bunch of lab samples that you get monthly that, you know, it's all about the, st the statistics and amalgamation of that information because, yeah, from that you can basically get insights. So if you're looking at long-term trends, you can identify something going wrong before it goes so wrong that Indeed, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, a, a gently rising, say, manganese level in a bore coupled with a conductivity change, things like that. Like, those two, those two things together, somebody might, might, might see them looking at a lab sample and be like, oh, that look, looks all right, but over the longer term, 
And especially if you if you statistically analyze it, you might be able to define that yes, the bore quality is changing for the worse or better. Um, and that allows you to be proactive rather than reactive when exactly. it comes to yep. making plant upgrades and improvements. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another another example is something that um, is often done at treatment plants, be it water or wastewater. Um, but I guess not 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 with the kind of um, level of information that is available. So it might sound like a strange statement, but for instance, like um, <laughs> chemical consumption, you know, like treatment plants consume a lot of chemicals. And typically the way the amount of chemicals is, is recorded would be if a chemical delivery is made and what they would do is write down the date of that delivery, how much it was, you know, might be a charge out fee. And then after five years, somebody wants to understand like what, what is the chemical usage? You know, what was it? Now, if they look at that data and they look at all those different deliveries, they'll get an idea of how much and what the costs were, but it has absolutely no context. You know, was the plant performing well? Was it performing poorly? Um, similarly, you can have a situation where, say, a, a coagulant dose flow meter might totalize every single day. Um, that's great. You know, every single day you know how much um, coagulant you're using. Um, but when plotted out over the longer term, again, it's like, well, how good was the plant performance? You know, during, during that period, like, we used twice as much coagulant. Was there a reason for that? Was it working well? Was it working poorly? Um, so using, using the data, things like, say, a coagulant flow, um, plus the plant's flow rate, and perhaps the plant waste discharge rate, you can put two and two together and you can compare things like the efficiency of the plant to treat the water or maybe the amount of solids that it produces um, with the chemical consumption. And whether it's over a yearly basis or a daily basis, it kind of depends on how much data you get and how frequently. But, um, but yeah, you can derive that, that information. And now for an operator, that, that may or may not be useful. Um, but for a manager who wants to understand like how well the plant is actually working mm. on a level that's not just, yes, we pass, passed or failed the drinking water standards or we breached or didn't breach our consents. Mm. You know, that, that is really um, a powerful use of the data and a lot yeah. of people have that information. It's just not used for that purpose. And I think it's, it's also kind of linking that forward to, I guess, where themes are going and, and just across industries globally. So, you know, once you have that understanding of and that more in-depth information on the operation of your plant, the how your chemical consumption, energy consumption, things like that are changing and how your efficiencies are shifting, you can really tie that into other aspects as well. So you can actually look at, um, for example, in a, in a treatment or a wastewater treatment plant context, um, your you know, daily or almost real-time carbon footprint. Now you might think, oh, that's, that's not really going to help me, but what it can do is when you have that volume of data, once you start seeing those trends, you can actually start adjusting how you operate the plant potentially to then reduce your overall carbon impact. Um, now, whilst that is probably something which is you know, still a little bit on the fringe at the moment, it is an option which allows, I guess, people that a deeper insight, deeper understanding of how their current operations might affect their carbon footprint, their carbon impact on the environment, for example. So it gives them that information so that can change. One, I guess, real point example around this was um, we've seen this example where someone's actually pulled in um, specific data on a pump and we started monitoring the individual pump's performance. So you're looking at sort of RPM, you're looking at flow rates, you're looking at pressure. And with that, you know, once you have that sort of real-time information coming in, you can actually plot that out versus what your expected efficiency is. So pumps will have efficiency curves, so you can actually monitor your pump versus that. And what the idea behind this was, was um, it was kind of leaning more into that predictive maintenance realm, whereas opposed to every six months go out and grease the bearings on the pump and every five years rip this out and replace it, I was actually looking and going, well, hold on, is this pump actually still performing? Are we seeing efficiency dips? Are we seeing um, potentially not efficiency gains? But, you know, how, how is it performing day to day? And what does that actually mean in the context, context of the treatment plants, our costs and so forth? And so it's trying to move people away just from that scheduled maintenance scheme to, to actually data-driven decisions on that. Um, and we were seeing examples of this as where you may have uh, pumps in different areas of a articulation network. One is running you know, 90% of the time and this one over here is running 10% of the time. Generally these will be on a five-year or three-year maintenance cycle where they'll just get ripped out and replaced. This pump here is almost brand new. You know, it, it's done hardly anything. 
This pump here has been running in almost full capacity for five years and is on the verge of failure. Again, it's trying to look at that data, get that understanding from these two different data sources and go, well, actually, this one here, we can change how we, how we deal with it, how we maintain it. This one here, it's actually worthwhile maintaining that, or, you know, replacing it every two years because of how it is. And then potentially you can go into your, you know, network flow balances and everything like that to try spread that load more evenly. But again, it's that insight, right? It's trying to tie these different large data sets together so you can actually visualize that and go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, it's all about what you can potentially infer from the data. And Working smarter, not Yeah, harder, and right? being proactive <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, talking about pumps and my example of the coagulant usage, uh, you might be getting a usage on a daily basis and suddenly that usage increases. Hmm. Now, plant performance might stay exactly the same. Now, why is that? There'll be a reason for it. Hmm. Um, but it's that kind of inference that you can then go and troubleshoot. You know, perhaps hmm. perhaps some um, plates or something like that have fallen off in your clarifier and the performance is worse hmm. all of a sudden. You know, um, but you wouldn't be able to see that issue without having that kind of analysis of the data. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this is still looking much forward further into the future as well. Um, I think where all this eventually leads and, and something that I'm personally excited about is actually going to that full predictive maintenance type cycles. Now, I know this is talked about in almost every conference and, and across multiple industries, <laughs> but some of the challenges, and this is linking back to the challenge of data again, is to be able to do predictive algorithms on maintenance events or failures, you actually need data with good failures. Yes. Um, so probably what we're seeing in the industry to date is that in that historic data has never been quite good enough to be able to actually really pick out those leading conditions before a failure, therefore being able to train a predictive algorithm. So it's something which I guess, you know, we as a company, we, we're watching quite closely, but it's something which is, you know, in future will be a lot more achievable as we get better data sources, as we understand that and get a deeper context to be able to then move from a reactive um, to a much more of a proactive type maintenance thing. So moving into that predictive realm. I still think personally that's a that's a few years away from being particularly accurate and, and usable, but that's kind of the direction that the industry is going, I feel. Well, thanks guys. This has been a really uh, interesting talk. I know I've learned something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you, Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, cool. Thanks.